Charlemagne, a name that echoes throughout history, and there's hardly any man that defined the early medieval period more than him and, of course, the dynasty from which he came and defined the Carolingian, or as they're also called, the Carlings, as they're called here in Crusader Kings 3. How they defined not just the early, early medieval period, but actually the trajectory of all European history ever since then. Hey everybody, Realm Builder Guy here, and welcome back to the channel in a new Crusader Kings 3 historical start guide video. In this video, I am going to guide you through the stories of the Carlings as they are present in 867 and, yes, 1066 as well. I'll give you some of their historical facts and backgrounds and talk a little bit about possible strategies that you can utilize if you decide to play as one of these great feudal lords. So, uh, without much further ado, let's dive right in. We're going to begin in the far west with Charles II, also known as the Bald, King of West Francia. The grandson of Charlemagne, he was given all of Gaul, i.e. West Francia, by his father, Louis the Pious. He actually grew up relatively uh, landless up until that time, which actually means something in terms of his interesting nickname, and I'll get to that in a little bit. He entered civil war with his brothers in 840, and that is a kind of major theme for this generation of Carlings. Not so much for the generation to follow. It ended with the Treaty of Verdun in 843, and it gave us the true parceling of Louis the Pious's realm, as we see on this map here. The Carling holdings of West Francia, Lotharingia, East Francia, and Italy. There was peace amongst the brothers, or it wasn't all brothers, but let's just say the brothers, until Ludwig the German, in East Francia, actually invaded West Francia in 858. Charles was extremely unpopular amongst the nobility in his own lands, and actually couldn't even raise an army, fleeing to Burgundy where the Welfs protected him. Following the death of his nephew, Lothair II, Lotharingia was then partitioned between Charles and said Ludwig in 870. Repeated wars against the Bretons, as well as the Viking invasions, including the sacking of Paris in 845, were the standard theme for him to deal with, aside from quarreling with his brother, Ludwig. In 875, Charles actually became emperor after the death of Louis II, who we'll get to a little bit later in this video. Ludwig, also contender to become emperor, then invaded West Francia in response to that, forcing Charles back all the way to Gaul. Ludwig died in 876, and Charles tried to conquer his kingdom, but was instead defeated at the Battle of Andernach. We'll get into that a little bit later as well. To aid Italy against the Saracens, Charles actually crossed the Alps in 877. So if you don't know, down here there are actually a number of Muslim holdings, and the Saracens would define them. Unfortunately, in his crossing of the Alps in 877, he had little, almost no support from the local nobility in northern Italy. Ludwig's son, Kalman, saw this as an opportunity to strike against Charles and invaded Italy himself. Charles then had to turn back north to secure his lands in West Francia before, you know, worrying that Karlman would actually invade his lands. But he died on the voyage home on October 6th, 877. Now, Charles was known as a very scholarly ruler who was close with the clergy, who made up the bulk of his council. Now, the nickname The Bald is actually has nothing to do with his hairline. He had plenty of hair, by all depictions and all accounts. But rather, it was an interesting insult due to his many years of landlessness until his father gifted him West Francia. So what is the likely strategy for Charles the Bald? here within Crusader Kings 3. You've got a number of titles. You also have claims, an unpressed claim on the Holy Roman Empire, pressed claims against the Kingdom of East Francia, and the Kingdom of Italy. Now remember, pressed claims will get inherited by 
your heir. In this case, it is Louis the Stammerer, who we will also talk about here in a second. Then you've got an unpressed claim against the Kingdom of Lotharingia, the Kingdom of Bavaria, the Kingdom of Burgundy, and then a few duchies and counties as well. Strategically, moving against Lotharingia is really the best bet for Charles. It is a relatively weak state, has a smaller army, is relatively isolated as well. Uh, with the powerful dukes and uh, nobles and vassals within West Francia, you should be able to conquer a good chunk of Lotharingia before East Francia comes in. And maybe you can even ally yourself with East Francia and or Italy against that. The other alternative is, of course, moving against Brittany, as well as Heston, who would be very powerful, and Olafur of Leon. So you've got a few holdings here to secure all of essentially France. The one thing you need to be very sure about as Charles is that you have the support of your nobles. You've got a very large realm, and Charles was historically exceedingly unpopular, which always caused him problems. He wasn't exactly a nice guy. You can see that he's deceitful, but he was a scholar, as is shown here. But securing a good relationship with your vassals and this is where royal court will come in rather nicely for you, is uh, very key because if you go against Lotharingia and then East Francia and the holdings within Italy, but at home you're dealing with rebellions all the time because your vassals don't like you, that's a problem. So before you look at expansion, maybe look at a little bit of internal consolidation first. Now within West Francia is the county of Belac, and here sits Prince Louis the Stammer of West Francia, son and heir to the West Francian throne. With a lot of implicit claims to his name, he too could expand relatively quickly. Now the son of Charles II became the King of Aquitaine and later all of West Francia, as one would expect once Charles did die in 877. He was physically very weak and actually didn't outlive his father by much, reputed to be a kind and very pious man. We can see here he's stuttering, a mastermind philosopher, craven, trusting, and content, but learning really high. So it is replicated rather nicely in here. The most notable acts were actually giving Catalonia counties to Wilfred the Hairy, and dying whilst marching an army to face invading Vikings in 879. So Louis the Stammer, really not a significant historical figure, aside from being relatively inept. But ineptitude is something that did run within the Carling family. Now, what do you do if you play as Louis the Stammer? Well, first of all, you've got to expand a little bit your internal power base, but you really just have to outlive your father, and you will then inherit all of West Francia. So play a little bit of a patient waiting game while consolidating your own fortune within Belac and maybe your holdings within Aquitaine and, and the rest of West Francia, building up your personal reputation, your renown, your prestige, and then once you take over as king of West Francia, that's when you can strike. And your strategy then would be the same as with Charles the Bald. Moving further west, we see Lothar II, or Lotha II, king of Lotharingia. So Lotharingia, or Lotharingia, depending on who, how you pronounce it. He was the son of Lothar I and brother to Louis II, the younger king of Italy. A truly unremarkable ruler, his reign was mainly spent trying to annul his marriage to his wife, Toitsbeaga. We married in 855. Here you see Queen Toitbega of Lotharingia. He wanted to marry his mistress, Waldrada, who gave birth to his only son, Hugh. You see him right here, Hugh, who is, that's right, a bastard. The desire for an annulment became a pawn in the power struggle for his lands by his uncles, Charles the Bald in West Francia, and Ludwig the German of East Francia. That's right. He is not a brother, he was just a nephew. 
Teutberga actually agreed to the annulment in 869, a woman who did not have an easy life with her husband. Lothair traveled to Rome to get the approval of the Pope, but got sick and actually died on the journey. Since his son Hugh was declared illegitimate, all of his lands passed to his younger, or to his brother, Louis II, the younger, on his death. But it didn't go as Louis would have hoped, or as Lothair had intended. And you can see here his primary heir is Louis the Younger of Italy. Because as mentioned before, his lands actually got divvied up between West Francia and East Francia. So if you're going to play as Lothair II, you've got a lot of titles and you've got quite a few claims, a few press claims, especially down in Italy. Now, the main thing you need to get as Lothair is a legitimate heir so that the lands don't pass to Louis the Younger. Because then, you know, the game's kind of over for you. But getting that heir should be your main concern. Now, you have a few daughters, but only the one son. If there's any way that you can legitimize Hugh, that's another way to go about doing that. But that's your main concern. It's all about making sure you have an heir that is not a brother or an uncle or a cousin or anything like that. So that's your primary concern. And staying close with Louis to help against the hungry eyes of East Francia and West Francia. Speaking of King Louis II the Younger, King of Italy. He was the grandson of Louis the Pious and son of Emperor Lothair I. He was actually crowned joint emperor with his father in 850. He reshaped the power landscape of, of Italy completely by ending internal wars and implementing his own selected nobles in key counties. Louis was successful in his campaigns in southern Italy against the Saracens that I had mentioned just previously, and he's actually currently at war with Emir Saudan of the Saudanite Emirate as we speak. He drove them from the city of Bari. Whilst there, his brother Lothair II died. But due to Louis being so far away, he couldn't actually stop his uncles Charles the Bald and Ludwig the German from dividing his brother's lands amongst themselves. After another successful campaign against the Saracens in southern Italy, Louis died on the road home. Since he never had a son, he actually named his cousin, Karlman, son of Ludwig the German, as his successor. So what do we do as King Louis? Now, interesting, of course, you don't have the emperor title here in CK3, but you could create it. You have unpressed claims to West Francia and East Francia. So by uniting the curling dynasty, the empire, the lands, you can then obviously create the Holy Roman Empire. But as such, it doesn't exist right now in 867 within the game. So as Louis, the main thing I would do is build a close relationship with one of your brother or with one of your uncles, actually. You know, the Lotharingia would be good too, since you're due to inherit that, maybe even in a very short while. But being close ally of either East Francia or West Francia will stop one or the other from marching into your lands. I would go for East Francia because you have a larger border to deal with them. Being close with Lothair would also be important. And then you just have to deal with West Francia itself. Beyond that, uniting Italy is clearly the way to go. You've got Benevento to deal with here. They are independent. Then you've got uh, the Greek Orthodox... Uh, Spartanos family here in Napoli, you've got Salerno, and then of course the um, Saracens uh, down here in the south, and then you also have some here to deal with in Sardinia, and the Byzantines also are on Italy, but uniting Italy should be one of your main goals as Louis, not just because he did it historically, but it just consolidates your lands and helps solidify your borders here. The first thing I'd go after is all of the uh, kingdoms down here and, you know, kind of trying to knock out the Savdanids who you are already at war with. After that, you can look at uniting the crowds here. If you do inherit Lotharingia, if Lothar does not get an heir, well, then you get a huge chunk here. Then life gets really, really, really interesting. Next, we head north to East Francia. 
and King Ludwig II the German. That is right, the name the German. He's the grandson of Charlemagne and son of Louis the Pious. He was made Duke of Bavaria in 817, fighting numerous wars against the Vents, Sorbs, and Bulgarians in the East. In 827, he married Hema of House Welf, the daughter of the ancestor of that house, who was Welf of House Welf. Here you see Queen Hema herself. Siding with his brother Charles the Bald against their brother Lothair I, Ludwig was instrumental in the brotherly civil wars earlier on in the 9th century. He was named King of East Francia following the Treaty of Verdun in 843. In 858, we already mentioned it, he launched an invasion of West Francia, encouraged to do so by the local nobles who hated his brother Charles. Again, a very common theme. But after two years, Ludwig couldn't conquer West Francia and signed a peace with his brother at Koblenz in the summer of 860. Ludwig and Charles had a private agreement in 868, meeting, you know, covertly at the city of Metz, that they would partition the lands of their nephew Lothar II upon his death. When this occurred in 869, Ludwig was engaged in a war against the Moravians, which another, a, a theme of the Carlings at the time. And Charles actually tried to seize all of Lotharingia for himself. Ludwig threatened his brother with war, and Charles backed down. The Treaty of Mazen then settled the issue, and they divided the lands, to which, remember, they had no legal claim amongst themselves. One thing you can definitely see so far already as a theme, Charles kind of a jerk. I mean, amongst a lot of jerks, but he was he was king of the jerks, so to speak. The other theme that Ludwig had to deal with were rebellions. Rebellions in run in this family, apparently, as Ludwig also spent most of the 860s fighting his rebellious sons, Kalman, Karl the Fat, and Ludwig the Younger. These rebellions were ended when Ludwig divided his kingdom up amongst his sons in 865, but it wouldn't actually happen until he died. Following the death of Louis the Younger in 875, Ludwig spent the last year of his life, unsuccessfully, petitioning the Pope for the Emperorship. But his brother Charles outmaneuvered him in Rome to win the Emperor title for himself. Ludwig died after a short illness at his palace in Frankfurt on August 28, 876. Interesting little side note, that nickname the German was only given to him in the 18th century. Contemporaries did, however, refer to him as King of Germania, or King of the Teutons, in reference to the geographic territory and its Roman names. It was not a reference to German people, which is a sentiment that did not really materialize until the later 18th, and then obviously into the 19th century, when you had an ideal of nationhood, which is something that just did not exist in the 9th century. So what is the strategy as Ludwig? Well, the good thing is you are one of the very few Carlings who has a solid heir. I mean, you saw it. Lotharingia doesn't have a solid heir. Italy doesn't have a solid heir. West Francia does, but eh, solid's kind of up for debate. And we're going to talk a lot about Ludwig's sons here in a minute. So you have an unpressed claim to the Holy Roman Empire. So push it. That is the way you would go. Press claims on Italy and West Francia and an unpressed uh, claim on the kingdom of Lotharingia. And you can also go for Burgundy, Duchy of Nordgau, and so on and so forth. The strategy here would be very simple. Going after Lotharinga. Sign a, you know, try to somehow get an alliance built with your brother, or with your nephew, sorry, not your brother, down in Italy, so that they're not going to be a problem, and then try to get as much land from Lotharinga as you possibly can. The other alternative, of course, is... Don't forget this border. You have a lot of pagans right over here and, of course, Vikings. You will be dealing with Vikings a lot. Lotharingia is another one. You'll be dealing with Vikings along the coast all the time. West Francia as well. So don't forget about that if you are here. Italy, less of an issue, at least initially. So as East Francia, you will have a small issue to contend with with raiding Vikings. But you will mainly be dealing with raiders coming from the east. So after possibly getting your alliance with Italy and divvying up some of Lotharingia, keeping an eye on Charles the Bald and what he does in West Francia, you definitely need to launch campaigns to the east and maybe instead of going to war with fellow Catholic power of Great Moravia, maybe building an alliance there so you can take on the likes of Bohemia, 
Lusatia, Lutetia, Lübeck, and so forth. So that would be my recommendation on how to play Ludwig. Moving on from Ludwig, we will now go to his three sons, starting with the eldest of Ludwig the German, and that is Prince Kalman, Duke of Bavaria. At least he's Duke of Bavaria in this game, and it kind of reflects what historically happened. His first recorded military action was actually in 842, leading reinforcements in battle with his father at Worms during the Carolingian Civil War. After marching them there all the way from Bavaria, so Worms would be right in this area right here, um, he was only 12 or 14 at the time. His exact birth year is unknown, but still, he was really young. He was a most warlike ruler, according to the chronicler Notka of St. Gall. In 850, he had an illegitimate son, Anulf, right here, but he is his primary heir, so he was able to legitimize him. Given the government sh governorship of Carantania in 856, Carlman immediately began expanding his influence and power base. He then led an expedition against Great Moravia. Again, I had mentioned they will be a common theme in 858. In a twist, however, Carlman actually formed an alliance with this man here, King Rostislav, in 862. Ludwig put down said rebellion in 863, and in 864, father and son reconciliated and reached a formal agreement. Carlman submitted to his father and was given the governorship of the Eastern Marches, which is basically this region right in here. In the division of Frankfurt in 865, Kalman was given the Duchy of Bavaria that he would rule as a principality after his father's death. Kalman was chosen to be Louis the Younger's successor, so Louis the Younger of Italy, to the throne of Italy. But Pope John VIII instead gave it to Charles the Bald following Louis' death in 875. Kalman then invaded Italy and Charles offered him a sizable payoff to leave Italy. It's unclear whether Kalman took the bribe, but he did eventually leave Italy. But of course, we can't forget this is all when Charles then eventually died. In 876, Ludwig the German died in 877. Charles the Bald died as well, thus leaving Kalman with the thrones of both Bavaria and Italy because he was the heir then after Charles the Bald, and yeah, it's, it's complicated papal history there. Kalman significantly expanded the power and the role of the clergy within Italy itself, which did ingratiate himself to the Pope. In 879, Kalman suffered a stroke and was seemingly forced to abdicate his thrones in Bavaria and Italy to his brother Ludwig the Younger, even though he wanted his illegitimate son Arnulf to inherit both thrones. Anulf was given the title of Margrave of Carinthia, but he would actually, believe it or not, become King of East Francia in 887 and eventually Emperor in 896. The following year, in 880, Kalman passed away and was buried in Etzing. So, what do we do if we are Prince Kalman? This is actually the playthrough I would enjoy the most because you have Kalman and then who would inherit East Francia, and you already have a legitimate son in Anulf. So you have a child. Now, it'd be good if you could maybe get a few other kids in the meantime, because you don't always just want to bank on the one. His claims are East Francia, the Kingdom of Bavaria, and the County of Baden. So you do have a toehold here as well to kind of work on that. If I were you, I would expand within East Francia itself, but play the waiting game a little bit. Your father's not going to live forever. Build up your internal power base and maybe, you know, quote unquote, crusade against Bohemia or head down here towards the Balkans and Greater Moravia. Building your power base there so that once your father does pass away, you inherit a very powerful position within East Francia. Moving just a little bit to the north west of Bavaria, we find Prince Ludwig the Younger of West Franconia. The second son of Ludwig the German, he was also a military man. He had very close ties with the nobility throughout East Francia, which granted him a level of independence from his father. Joining in the rebellion against his father, Ludwig was granted the lands of Saxony, Thuringia, and Franconia in 865. He would rebel against his father two more times in 871 and 873, but each time quickly reconciled. He always saw himself as the true heir to Ludwig the German. 
after his father's death in 876. That same year, Charles the Bald tried to actually annex parts of Lotharingia, but Ludwig defeated his forces at the Battle of Andernach, which I had mentioned when I was talking about Charles the Bald. Ludwig never made any attempts to wage war against his brothers, unlike the generation before. And that is the interesting thing. The three brothers, the three sons of Ludwig, even though they rebelled against their father and saw the wars amongst their uncles and cousins, never waged war against each other. Ludwig the Younger eventually gained the crown of Bavaria upon his brother Kahnemann's death in 880. He always tried avoiding any type of war or conflict as best he could, especially within his own realm and amongst his own nobility. He was an astute statesman and politician by all accounts, maneuvering his vassals in very intelligent ways. In 879 and 880, Ludwig led successful campaigns against the Viking incursions along the coast of the Low Countries, so up here, where his son, Hugh, fell in battle. Now, they, he doesn't have a son yet, and he's not even married. We'll get into that here in strategy in a second. Ludwig died after an illness in 882. Without an heir, since Hugh fell, all his lands fell into the hands of his younger brother, Karl, who I will talk about next. But first, we're going to talk strategy. So what do we do for Ludwig the Younger? Well, first of all, marry. That's very, very clear. Get married, produce some heirs. Now, you are not in direct line to inherit the throne of East Francia. Instead, you are behind your brother, Kalman. Now, you can, of course, try to wage war against your brother, but I would find it more interesting, from an historical standpoint, to avoid war amongst Ludwig's heirs, if that's possible, to try to play that way. So what do you do? Well, you continue to grow your power within East Francia, kind of eat it up from the inside itself. There are enough other lands here, the Swabians, the, which is your brother. We'll get to him in a minute. But we've got Nassau next to it, Thuringia, Angria, and so on. Your claims implicit on East Francia and the Kingdom of Bavaria and the County of Baden to the south do give you some reason and justifications to go to war. You can see here as an aggressive attacker and skilled tactician that his military background is represented within the game. He is gregarious, a little fickle, and, but he is very honest. So by all accounts, Ludwig was a decent person given the time he was in. So I personally would try to build from within and then maybe eat up East Francia. Now the problem is if you decide I'm not going to go to war with my brother, it's going to be a little bit different, difficult. So maybe you just have to go to civil war to overthrow your brother eventually. But who knows what happens when Lotharingia falls into who knows whose hands. To the south of West Franconia, we have Swabia or Schwaben. And sitting here is Prince Karl, also known as the Fat, the youngest son of Ludwig the German. He would become the last Karling emperor of legitimate birth, that is, and the last to rule over all of the lands of the Franks, as his great-grandfather Charlemagne had done. He was the beneficiary of outliving basically everyone, and that so few of them had legitimate heirs. Inheriting the lands of Alemania in 876 after his father's death, the Kingdom of Italy after Karlman's death, all of Ludwig the Younger's lands after his death, thus reuniting East Francia, and then finally West Francia in 884 after his cousin, Karlman II, died. Without invading any of these lands or waging war, Karl had reunited the entire Carolingian Empire in less than 10 years. For unknown reasons, he was nicknamed the Fat in the 12th century, so this wasn't a contemporary nickname. It's interesting that Paradox didn't include his nickname, even though they included Ludwig, the Germans, despite the fact that Ludwig's nickname was given a few centuries after Karl's nickname was given, and nobody knows. There are no contemporary records indicating that Karl was indeed overweight. In 880, Karl aided the Pope against the Duke of Spoleto, and as a reward, Karl was crowned Emperor in 881. So, very successful for really not having to do much. Dealing with Vikings became the biggest issue Karl had to deal with, both in East and West Francia. He actually paid off the armies of Siegfried and Rollo to leave Paris and West Francia, since he had no interest in any armed conflict with the Norsemen. This act deeply hurt his reputation in West Francia, and the nobles would never forget or forgive. 
Much like all Carlings, Carl had no legitimate heir. He tried in vain to have his illegitimate son, Bernard, recognized as his heir. He was seen as a lucky ruler rather than a competent one. He possibly adopted his nephew, Louis the Blind, from the Provence, as his potential heir in a power move to try and secure the support of the nobles of said area of northern Italy and that region of West Francia. Carl called together an assembly in Frankfurt in November of 887. When word reached the assembly that Carlman's son Anulf was marching on Frankfurt with an army of Bavarians and Slavs, everyone abandoned Carl. He had no allies sitting in Frankfurt and waiting. Anulf showed up and quickly deposed Carl, and who then moved to a country holding and died just six weeks later in January of 888. The empire completely fell apart after Carl's deposition. Anulf gained East Francia and Lotharingia. Odo gained West Francia for a short while. Berengar became the king of Italy. Louis the Blind became the king of Provence. Upper Burgundy split off into its own kingdom under the Welfs. Ranulf II was crowned himself, actually, as king of Aquitaine. The Carolingian Empire of Charlemagne would not be united again, or at least not the lands, into one realm until Napoleon. And thus really ended the power of the Carolingians with the, um, you know, falling apart of Karl's empire. Because it was never united again. So what do you do? Well, you have a wife. So try and get an heir because look who's your primary heir, your brother Karlman. You want to avoid that at all costs. Now, Karlman, maybe just play the waiting game. You've got an implicit claim on East Francia and Bavaria and the county of Baden. Expanding here into the Breisgau, Zurich, St. Gallen, and Grisson might be your best bet. Maybe even Nordgau. Maybe you do wage war against one of your brothers or both. But waiting it out is probably the best scenario because Italy is just to the south. Lotharinga right here. You're actually in a, an interesting position between all these different realms, not sharing a border with any of the major powers. Instead, you could eventually share that border. But playing the waiting game, but securing your lineage is your number one priority. Getting an heir, and ideally more than one, lined up so that, you know, your brother doesn't inherit everything from you. Ultimately, the goal that every player who plays a Carling in 867 should have is to unite all of Charlemagne's realm. So that is West Francia, Lotharingia, East Francia, and Italy. You'll always be dealing with incursions from the north, with the Norsemen raiding your coasts all the time. You actually already have them within your own realm of Lotharingia here in Frisia. So these are all things you have to deal with. Then, of course, you have the Umayyads down here that West Francia will have to deal with. So keeping an eye on what happens in Iberia, as well as the incursions from the pagan east and north. So it's an interesting idea to play as one of the kings already right away. You get access to the royal court right away. But for me, the one that I would pick, well, that's very clear. That is Prince Carlin of East Francia. This is the Carling in 867 that I personally would play as. Why? Well, one, you already have an heir. You've got plenty of uh, claims. You are first in line to inherit all of East Francia. And your father is already 61 years old. So in a very short order, you could become king of East Francia and then move against the lands uh, of your fellow Carlings. But of course, we can't do a Carling guide without speaking about the last Carling in the game. And that is Count Ebert of Vermandois. The final chapter in the Carling line came with the Lombard branch of the dynasty in the Counts and Countesses of Vermandois. Not much is known actually about uh, Abbot himself. It's more his daughter, Adelaide, who is this little girl here, Adele, uh, who married the son of French King Henry I, a Capet, Hugh the Great, who actually ruled as the first Capetian Count of Vermandois, but died during the First Crusade. Following Hugh's death, Adelaide ruled as the Countess of Amandois, and upon her death in 1120, the Carling ceased to rule the County of Amandois. The final Carling line through the 
Herbertian branch and the Counts of Chigny went extinct in the early 13th century. So after that, the line and dynasty of Charlemagne was no more. So how do you play as the last Carling? Well, of course, you are within the lands of King Philippe of France. So waging war against some people here was probably the best bet. You have to expand your power base, gain some good, strong allies, and play the marriage game. That is your best bet. You're 34. You do have two children, Eudis Carling as well as Adele. So at least your lineage is secure for now, but a few more kids really wouldn't hurt marriage alliances so that you could start gobbling up some of the counties around you would be the main thing I would go after. You have absolutely no claims, so it's a definite difficult start, but one that can be very rewarding and a lot of fun. And there you have it. That is my historical start guide and strategy guide to the Carlings here in Crusader Kings 3. Let me know if you've ever played as any of the Carlings, and if you plan on doing it, maybe now. If you have any questions, drop those in the comments below as well. Please don't forget to hit the like button. Subscribe to not miss out on any Crusader Kings 3 content. You can go check out a bunch of the other videos I have here on the channel about Crusader Kings 3 and a lot of other strategy games. If you want to support the channel, links to my Nexus GG store where you can get Crusader Kings 3 with the Royal Court uh, amongst a lot of other games. You can also... Uh, support the channel on Patreon, link in the description there. You can follow me on Twitter and Twitch, and join the Discord. Again, all those links down below. So until next time, I'm Realm Builder Guy, and I will talk to you soon. Bye.